All right, here I'm with actor Rick Cosnett, who uh, many fans will recognize from The Vampire Diaries, um, Quantico, and also The Flash. When did you first decide you wanted to become an actor? Well, um, I think when I was probably like two or three, I, my parents used to do community musical theater in Zimbabwe, and um, I really fell in love with it back then. And even though when I was little, I used to say I wanted to be a lawyer, or which is probably what I would have been if I wasn't an actor, um, you know, or a doctor, whatever. But as soon as I knew it was a job, I was I was set on, on doing it. And I, when I knew we were moving to Australia, I knew what drama schools I was going to apply to and stuff. And so, you know, it didn't really go that smoothly, but that was sort of the trajectory started at an <laughs> early age. <laughs> oh, need. what types of work did you do in Australia before you came over here and broke into the American television um, In Australia landscape? I did mainly theatre. Um, I did a lot of theatre, I did a lot of touring shows, I did a lot of kids shows, I did mm -hmm. kids musicals, um, I was on, I did some TV over there, I did some film, um, and yeah, when I was 27 I moved to the States and, and gave it a crack in Los Angeles and then after a while started doing some stuff, I did a pilot, and I did um, um, small, not that many small things before I got the Vampire Diary, so I was quite lucky to, I think, yeah, but I, 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 I just, it was hard for a long time, and I, uh, but it, it felt like, <laughs> like a millennial, you know, <laughs> like, but, but when I look back on it, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it took that long, but, um, yeah. You played Dr. West on the Vampire Diaries? Mm -hmm. For the Vampire Diaries, you, you were able to uh, have a little bit of longevity, which was nice. Yes. Uh, then you moved on to The Flash, where you were uh, Eddie, and you were one of the original cast members, but unfortunately, you were, you were killed off I on the first... Yes. that too. You, you did <laughs> yes. die. You're very good at dying, I have to I say. I am. People call me the Sean Bean of television. <laughs> what was that experience like, um, having already been established on a CW show, to go on to star in The Flash's first season? It was, it was an amazing thing for all of us because we were also, um, well not all of us I should say, you know, Jesse and Tom obviously um, were very established, right. but the young, <laughs> young, young ones of us, especially me and Carlos Valdez, were just so excited to be there um, and we, we never complained about anything, we were like, this is awesome, you know, um, but it was, it was great to, I think, I think be able to create with, with all these other people something that was kind of unknown and that we didn't know what it was going to be but we were all so so um invested mm -hmm. um in in the story and in the flash and to make it something very special i think we all really connected and kind of fell in love with it and fell in love with each other it was it was a pretty awesome time in my life yeah very cool and then uh, after eddie's untimely demise you uh moved on to quantico yeah you played elias harper mm -hmm. Uh, what was that experience like? Uh, not only jumping networks, but also you know, going on to a show that had a lot of buzz around it in terms of the content and that kind of thing. It was cool. It was it was um, you know it hadn't aired yet because I started in the second episode, mm -hmm. and so we also didn't know what it was, which I always find to be fascinating um, because it hasn't been established what this thing is going to be. So mm -hmm. everyone has their opinions and everyone's trying to work out what the vibe is and what the tone is of this whole thing. And so um, I was so lucky that I had this very um, clear character and a character that, wanted been wanting, that they'd been wanting to create for a very long time. Um, and so Elias, um, I, had, I, had, I didn't really know how to pitch him at first, but then I, I, Carlos um, calls my alter ego <laughs> this crazy name and I, I, I suddenly realized that Elias was kind of had a bit of my alter ego in there and, and from that moment on I knew exactly who he was and what they were trying to do and and they really wrote very well for me on that show so I was I was lucky and it was so fun I mean there was such a diverse cast mm -hmm. and such an interesting group of, of people I mean diverse in every way character wise as well and we all actually got along like a house on fire yeah and unfortunately he also Yes. And did go, I mean, hey, you've gone a yeah. bunch of different ways. You've gone out a window, you've gone... Yeah, uh, I really have done it all, um, <laughs> dying-wise. Um, yeah, suicides, and they've been very dramatic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 
it, it, it's, it's kind of pushed me into the next thing every time I've died, you know. It's kind of been a blessing in a lot of ways because I've, I haven't been able to be complacent. Mm -hmm. I've always have to kind of strive to be better and get more stuff and audition again. And um, yeah, I think that's actually served me well, even though it's been highly uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to ask before you get cast. Am I, am I, how long am I lasted on this show, right? Yeah, well, you just never know, you know. True. You, they don't even know half the time until, you know, until things kind of work themselves out. Now, in your newest project, you're actually not starring in, it's called The Letter Carrier. Um, talk a little bit about um, what made you bring this project to life and explain a little bit of the story. I know it's based on a, a lore of a, a, a letter carrier who, who kills people, supposedly, and, but <laughs> yeah. really there's also, he's not in this, folks, he's not going to die in this one. But, totally, uh, I, I'm not. Um, but there's also but a, another not. meaning, yeah, there's also <laughs> another meaning just for the culture of the film as well and, and what the story is about. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think this this project is quite experimental in a sense and is also not your your average um, what do you say? Um, you know, it's not it's not the average formula mm -hmm. for a film. We very much went against that, um, deliberately. So it's quite interpretive in a way and you really have to listen. You have to listen to the words, you have to listen to the songs. You have to feel the context, and it's it's, it's a very mysterious, mysterious project um, in that sense. And so, um, it's it's pretty much a an original folklore. Mm -hmm. It's set in Virginia in 1860. So you know what was going around in, uh, going on in Virginia at that time was that it was the end of just near the end of slavery. I think slavery ended in 1865, and this is the background of almost a children's bedtime story. Mm -hmm. So, you know the song Ring a Ring a Rosie's, Pocket Full of Posies, A Tissue, A Tissue, We All Fall Down. Right. Right, which is actually about the Black Plague in England. And it has quite quite a sort of somber, um, you know, really, really, well, it has all these connotations um, around, you know, these, these social connotations and around that time. Um, but children sing it and they dance and sing and laugh and fall down. And so Jesse Martin, who's a genius, wrote these stories um, in that same vein, so that you know you kind of get the sense of foreboding from these very happy-sounding songs, um, which also ring quite true in, in tone-wise to that time and to slave songs mm -hmm. and all of that. And we decided not to do it with any kind of um, soundtrack that. Um, was put upon it. So all the sounds are natural and they come out of the environment. Um, so you're not getting that almost, I, I feel like it's cheating a little bit when people tell you how to feel with the soundtrack, but it works amazingly well and, right. and I love films like that too, but this is not one of those films. Um, so we really tried to capture that extra layer of reality from the sounds in the environment and from the people living in that environment. Um, to create quite a magical and and um, unique atmosphere mm -hmm. in the story of this world, which is basically this mother who keeps her children hidden from slavery in the mountains. Um, and there's this fable of the letter carrier which keeps them um, from going, from leaving the mountain. Um, and it's all about what we tell children and how much they listen and how much um, and what they take from that. Um, and, you know, it has obviously a lot of parallels to what's happening today mm -hmm. in today's society um, in terms of race and um, finding our place and belonging and also the whole thing about what's, what's wrong and, and right with America. Right. Yeah. Um, how, what was it like for you to be on the other side of the camera and be a director and you're also involved in the casting as well, right? Yeah. We were. It was. It was amazing. I mean, it was. It was this. It was this epic journey, really, from the beginning of pre-production to the very end of post, painstaking post-production. Mm -hmm. um, it was incredible for us to be able to go through all that. Um, and Jesse and I became such good friends on the Flash that it really was cool because we've had. We've you know we've been forced to continue this great friendship. Which <laughs> for, both, forced. Yeah, forced. <laughs> against our will. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just such great friends that it's it's really been an incredible um, journey. And and we, we work so well together that we, you know, when we clash, it's it's just, 
it's kind of it's it's creatively it's not it's it's nothing personal you know so it's it's been a great dynamic i hope that we're going to do a feature sometime sometime soon in africa that would be um, cool but you know this i was very honored to be able to direct this thing i've forgotten your question yeah <laughs> that was, what, was your question? what was it like switching hats and yeah so so and we cast it out of vancouver and it was all from the vancouver film community and and and, and the actors are from vancouver as well mm -hmm. so it was actually quite challenging to find the uh, the actors that we wanted for the parts but we ended up finding some fantastic people um and it ended up being um a really cool experience you know getting to know all of them and, and having them all in those roles and yeah, yeah, we we got some spectacular um, performances too. That's great. And you're you're shopping around different festivals now. Yeah, we're entering it into festivals and going from there. And hopefully, um, you know, eventually we'll just we'll actually release it online for people to see because you know it was all backed by Kickstarter. So right. we really did it for those those people. Were you surprised at the reaction that you were able to? Um Going oh, yeah. in, did you did you think you would be able to get your goal? Uh, no, we were completely overwhelmed. Um, we, I think it, you know, it kind of caught fire um, as it went along um, because of a number of different factors. But I think, you know, Carlos uh, is such a musical prodigy, a genius. Mm -hmm. That h having him involved was amazing, and obviously Jesse Martin, who everyone knows from Rent and um, everything else, having him there was good. And then. Joss Whedon ended up donating a whole lot of money to the Kickstarter, and so as a thank you present, we did this harmony to the um, theme song for Firefly, and all the Firefly fans were so devastated when that got cancelled. Right. That, um, they all loved it so much, and and then it kind of, you know, got so many hits on, on YouTube, and then the whole the whole kind of campaign took off, and we we raised way more money than we thought we would, but. Um, Boy, did we end That's up a, needing it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how when you start a project, you think you'll need yeah. X, and then it's always way I'm more sorry, than X, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's quite, it's quite stressful because, yeah, just you know, and it, it did become such a such an amazingly big production. Mm -hmm. As Jesse said, we had an embarrassment of riches. You know, we had so many people coming in to help out, and so many people just willing to be part of the story because they thought it was so cool and. Most of the crew, you know, were saying to us, you know, that this was the best experience they'd ever had on a set, and we had three magical days of sunshine in Vancouver, which doesn't happen very often. Um, so, yeah. And now you mentioned you started out in theater uh, in Australia. You're here in New York, uh, pounding the pavement, right? You're hoping mm -hmm. to do some theater here. Yeah. What is? Uh, I know you're also a big proponent of going to theater, and from mm -hmm. your social media, you're very yeah, into, yeah. into performances and stuff. What is a, a role that you would like to tackle? something original or would you like something already established? Um, I would love to do Hamlet. I really would. I've never done that before. Um, and I um, I actually always wanted to play Richard the Lionheart, but I, I did in um, The Lion in Winter, actually in Santa Barbara mm -hmm. um, a few years ago. Um, but I'm obsessed with that character and I would love to play him on stage or in a film, um, even though he was kind of messed up. But that's why I could guess what's going to be like. <laughs> um, yeah, those would probably be my two my two picks. But you know, there are, the thing about the theater, I think, as well, is that um, is that you get to embody embody a, a lot of characters that you wouldn't necessarily get to play mm -hmm. on TV. But you might get to play on film when you when you're very established and people know you and trust you. Um, you know, like Michael Fassbender, I think right. now can sort of play Quasimodo if he kind of wanted to. Right. Whereas I can't, <laughs> you know, um, yet. So, yeah, I was just going to so say, don't, don't sell yourself short. Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, Quasimodo is one of the one of my favorite, favorite characters who I would absolutely die to play in either the musical or the or a stage version or, or film. Um, I relate to him in some weird, messed up way. Yeah. And if there's one thing you're good at, it's dying. So don't don't yeah. say that too loud that you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. If I die in a play, it's fine though, because I get to do it over and over again. There you go. Um, what would you like to say to your fans who have followed you from, you know, from the Vampire Diaries right straight through to today, um, and would, support the film? Yeah, I would just like to say thank you guys. Honestly, um, it's it's incredible that a, a lot of people have been with me from day one in the Vampire Diaries before they even saw me. Um, in on the show, they just seen a picture of me, and they were all they were really supportive. So, um, yeah, 
thanks for being with me and, and, and please continue to support me and I promise to provide you with some very high quality work. I'm only going up from here. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you so much for taking time to, to meet up Thank with me so and doing much. this interview. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian.